Good morning, College Church of Christ. It is great to see everybody here today. So thankful to have you here, whether you're a guest, whether you're a member, it's great to see you this morning. And we do ask you, before I forget, to fill out uh, the Connect card that's in front of you in the pew. We'd love to have your information and know that you're here. And if you want to use our fancy QR code, you can fill that out as well online on your phone. And again, a reminder, feel free to put any prayer requests or needs on the back of the Connect card and just place that in the tray during the contribution time as it comes through during communion. So good to have everybody here this morning. So, happy Father's Day. Yeah. Happy Father's Day, dads. There's nothing better than getting to be a dad. And so we married off our oldest son last night, and we finally gained a daughter into our family. And so right before the ceremony started, my, my oldest son asked me to marry them and do the wedding ceremony. So as you can imagine, there's going to be a little bit of emotion involved. Yeah. <laughs> And so right before I go down the aisle, my oldest son, Ethan, he recognizes that, and he comes up to me, he puts his hands on my shoulders, and he goes, you got this, Dad. And, and then he prayed over me. <laughs> and so as I'm doing the wedding ceremony, I'm looking at this cloud of witnesses around us. I'm feeling this just immense love and affection towards my son and his soon-to-be bride in that moment. And I thought... This is just a picture, a taste of the Heavenly Father's love for us. The Father's heart for us. And so let's stand and worship this Heavenly Father this morning. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth 
Amen. Go ahead and be seated. <laughs> there is beyond the azure blue
gonna have a little Father's Day video. Why did God give us that? So they could care for us, to help take care of us. To help with the moms, to help around the house, and to keep our family straight. Help mothers do stuff so they don't have to be alone. So like they can like teach us right things. What's your favorite thing to do with your dad? Play with him. Um, play outside. Work on the truck with him. Play softball with him. Probably play golf. Um, I like to do taekwondo with him and ask him fun science questions. How does your dad act like Jesus? He helps people when he sees they need a need. He's very merciful. Telling us stories in the Bible. Uh, by having fun with me and, and feeding me healthy food. To help our family and provide us good lives. What are you going to get your dad for Father's Day? Probably a hug. Probably a mug that that says you're nice, kind of funny. Probably a midnight oil card or a pop-up card. The level three of Link. I mean Zelda. What is something funny that your dad does? Um, whenever he comes home and he's cooking dinner and I go into the kitchen, he usually rubs my head. Oh, when we're sad, he tickles us. He makes silly faces. Makes jokes. Dad jokes. He has very bad dad jokes. He tells uh, fun dad jokes, even though sometimes they aren't very fun. Whenever I say, Dad, I'm hungry. Hello, my name is Dad. Nice to meet you, hungry. Do you do anything that's just like your dad? No. Um, I laugh a lot. We both do silly stuff. Well, whenever he tries to get on the phone, he says, yeller, and I say, yeller? We laugh loud together. Uh, we like the same things. Sometimes I act like him, like he, he, I went to work with him today, and he, he said something about the horse that he was working on, and I said that same thing whenever we were going home. What would your dad say to you right now? He would say that he would love me. I love you. He'd say, keep on going. You're doing a good job. Uh, keep on going. Be respectful. You're doing great. Keep on worshiping Jesus. I'll be reading Matthew 7, 7 through 12. Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Everyone who asks will receive. The one who searches will find. The door will be opened to the one who knocks. Suppose your son asks for bread. Which of you will give him a stone? Or suppose he asks for a fish. Which of you will give him a snake? Even though you are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven... Uh, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And everything do to others what you would want them to do to you. This is what, in, what is written in the law and in the prophets. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to come together each and every week and worship and praise you. Lord, on this Father's Day, we thank you for the opportunity we have to, to um, encourage our dads. And I know on this earth that not everyone shares that same great experience with their father. But I, I believe that if we were to document and list out all of the things that we view as being ideal of a, of a perfect father, that you would check every one of those boxes. Help us to remember that we have that example, that you are there guiding us and protecting us, and that we can aspire to be like you and to, to live up to that standard. Lord, guide us as we go through this day, through this week, and through our lives. Help us to worship you and lead others to you, to be an example as, as fathers and future fathers. Guide us and protect us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen.
Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name. are singing beautiful this morning. <laughs> Why did my Savior come to In August of 1991, I had the opportunity to travel to the USSR with my family on vacation. And this was the age of perestroika and glasnost, the time of opening up of the Soviet Union. And I don't think sixth grade Greg appreciated 
what it meant to travel behind the Iron Curtain and be in the Soviet Union. Um, I remember that trip being incredibly depressing and tense. I remember Red Square seemingly uh, empty and hollow. I remember the oppressiveness of the red walls of the Kremlin kind of looming in the background. Um, but I do have one happy, joyful memory mixed into that experience, and that was on a Sunday when our tour group had the opportunity to worship in a church. This wasn't an Eastern Orthodox church with its vast cavernous halls and its painted icons, but it was a gospel church. I don't know which mission group planted that church, but I know that that church had endured a lot of persecution under the Soviet era, and I know that it was uh, joyful to be celebrating uh, the opportunity to worship openly and, and freely. And I remember the smiling faces in that church. I remember the joyful singing. I remember the moment when the communion elements were passed and everybody participated in communion. I think that was probably the first moment when I understood what Jesus said in John 6, 35. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. I've often thought about that church and the experience of worshiping with those people who I didn't share their language, I didn't share their culture or their history, but through that act of communion, we were one body in Christ. And I'm grateful that I had that opportunity because through Christ, we are one. And through the elements of communion, we get to connect with God in this greatest moment of his sacrifice. And we get to remember all the way back to the first disciples who shared that communion in the upper room without even understanding what it meant for Christ to sacrifice his body and blood. Let's pray over the body. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift of bread that we're about to receive. We know that this stands as a symbol for the body of your Son that was given freely as a sacrifice for us, that was lifted up on the cross so that we might be free from the iniquity that separates us from you. We pray that we'll take this bread in a worthy manner and that we'll remember Christ's sacrifice. In his name we pray. Amen. Shortly after my family left uh, Moscow with the tour group, the hardline Soviets who were a little bit angry at the opening up of their country uh, held a coup against uh, Gorbachev and they tried to seize power. And um, it was a very tense moment because there were helicopters flying through the, the night sky, there were tanks rolling down the streets, there were troop transport vehicles going all over the place and I remember being really nervous that maybe we'd be caught in the middle of this revolution and, and that there would be um, bloodshed. But I, I have another distinct memory, and that's my father on the balcony of our hotel 
trying to tune his little pocket radio in to the BBC or the Voice of America to get actual reporting on what was happening because the television only had propaganda on. And I knew that I would be safe because my father was there with me and he would keep me safe. Fortunately, our tour group never saw any fighting uh, and we didn't get to experience any bloodshed. To this day, I don't know how many Russians lost their lives in the struggle for their freedom that August. Uh, but I think it bears considering that freedom comes at the price of bloodshed. I think I want to say that again. Our freedom, especially from sin, comes at the price of bloodshed. And I'm very grateful that we have a Savior that doesn't consider equality with God something to be grasped onto, but who freely sheds his blood so that we can enjoy that freedom from our sin. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cup that we're about to receive. We know that it represents the ultimate price of bloodshed to purify us, to wash us from the sin that encompasses us, that seeps into our very nature. We thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus willingly made on the cross for us, to bleed and die so that we don't have to be separated from you. We thank you for this sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. prepared for in the USSR was the black market. Uh, everywhere we went, it seemed like there would be people who would come up to us and want to trade something with us. Maybe for a, a pair of jeans or a pair of Nikes, they would offer us some souvenir or, or gift. And uh, they, they all seemed to have a phrase in English that they knew whether they could speak English or not. And that phrase was, very cheap, must buy. Um, and I'm very grateful that we have a Savior that doesn't require us to buy our salvation. That the offerings that we present this morning are gifts to advance the gospel in other places, to, to spread the message of salvation to other people, but they're not compelled. This is not an arrangement where we are buying our salvation. And uh, as it says in, in 2 Corinthians, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, and I'm grateful that we're not uh, under obligation to share our gifts 
uh, to keep the church working. Let's pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless this gift that we're about to give. We, we pray that you will bless the church to use the gift, uh, bless the elders who are responsible for overseeing the missions that the church uh, participates in. We pray that these gifts will be uh, multiplied and will bring back a great harvest for you. We thank you for the opportunity to share so freely with everything that you have given us with great love. We pray these blessings on your gifts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people declare your mighty works, blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord. Children ages three through first grade may be dismissed during this next song. And let's stand and sing together. We're excited about Vacation Bible School starting tonight as you see the setup, the hometown of Nazareth of Jesus behind me. Again, it's not too late to sign up, and we have a lot who have already signed up. It's going to be a great, great week of Vacation Bible School. Lord, I lift your name on high. take a moment to pray for Levita Purdue, and so we're going to pray for her right now as she's being tended to. Father God, we love you. We praise you. We know you're the Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. We know you're the Lord who meets our every need, and we pray for Miss Levita right now. We just pray for whatever's going on with her, Father, that, that you heal her quickly, and those who are attending to her, you give them the wisdom, the expertise to know what to do. And so, God, we lift up Levita to you right now, and we trust in you, Father, with her, and we thank you for her. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Remain standing for this last song before uh, Jordan speaks to us this morning. <clears throat> oh, worship the King, all glorious above.
Good morning, and happy Father's Day to all of our fathers and grandfathers, great-grandfathers, father figures, fathers-to-be, and aspiring dads. We are so grateful for each and every one of you. We wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for you. For those for whom this is an exciting day, full of wonderful memories, as well as for those that This might be a challenging day. I hope that my sermon will remind you of at least one male figure in your life who has been supportive, encouraging, and has been there for you all of these days. Special thank you to Noel for his lesson last week on the boundless love of God, and for all of our worship leaders reminding us about Father God, who is always there for us. Well, as we heard a few moments ago in the video, dads are known for their wonderful jokes. So, it wouldn't be a Father's Day sermon without a few dad jokes. These are some that came from my dad when I was growing up. Did you know that baseball is mentioned in the Bible? Genesis 1-1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's okay to laugh or roll your eyes, whichever one comes more natural for you. Uh, What about tennis? Did you know that tennis is mentioned in the Bible? Moses served in Pharaoh's court. All right, one more, one more. Did you know that Pharaoh's daughter was the first financier in the Bible? She went down to the bank and drew out a little profit. All right, I'll save the other 439 dad jokes for later. But all kidding aside, we are so grateful for our dads, their courage, their fortitude, your willingness to provide for us through all circumstances. We love you, dad jokes and all. But no dads are perfect, uh, yet the Bible gives us these role models, these examples of dads who often get it right. And when they don't get it right, they get back up and they set a good example for future generations. This morning, I want to talk about two of the greatest kings of Israel. And in hindsight, they were relatively good dads that we can learn a lot of lessons from. I'm talking about David and Solomon. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 Chronicles 17. 1 Chronicles 17. Looking forward to the day when your Bible is just open to Chronicles. Uh, my favorite books of the Old Testament. 1 Chronicles 17. Now David was king about 1000 BC, technically 1010. I tell my students to remember 1000 because it's a good even number. And if you remember that, you can add 40 to it to see when Saul ruled, and you can subtract 40 from it to see when Solomon ruled. So when did David rule? About 1,000 B.C. Good job. God took the kingdom away from Saul because he was a wicked king. He offered sacrifices as if he were a priest in a way that he shouldn't have. And he didn't offer sacrifices that he should have, and he lost his focus consulting a medium or a witch instead of the Lord. So God gave the kingdom to David, a man after God's own heart, a man who killed Goliath with a stone and a sling, a man who did not retaliate against Saul when he hunted him to the ends of the earth. A man who united the kingdom when all 12 tribes were severely scattered. David is the kind of ruler we need today in our nation and in our homes. In fact, your kids couldn't care as much about who's in the White House as they care about who's in their house. Your kids want to follow you. Dads, they want to be just like you. And if your heart is searching after God's heart, they will follow God. That's what David did. Do you know the first thing he did as king? He wanted to prepare a place for God. In 1 Chronicles 17, verse 1, it says, When David lived in his own house, David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I dwell in a house of cedar, 
But the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. He says, I'm living in this beautiful, gorgeous, expensive house while God is living in a dingy old tent going all the way back to the days of Moses. How could I enjoy this splendor? There's a big difference between a tent and a house. I know from firsthand experience this past weekend, we went camping at Woolly Hollow. It's a big difference between a house and a tent, not just air conditioning and plumbing and electricity, but a tent is made for temporary dwelling, to dwell outside, while a house is made for those who want to be inside. It's a permanent place. David didn't want God just living in a temporary place that he could visit God every once in a while for a few hours or a few days. He wanted God to live permanently with him, with his family, with all Israel. He didn't want God in a tent. He wanted God in his home. When we as dads decide that we want God in our home, he will come and dwell with us. Nathan says, that's a great idea. Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. You have the green light. It's a great idea. Go forward with it. Dads, imagine we have the green light to do whatever is in our heart to the glory of God. To to build that business to the glory of God. To find that cure, that advancement in technology to the glory of God. To to store up money as a legacy, as an inheritance for future generations to the glory of God. To develop something permanent instead of something temporary. Nathan says, go ahead. But then that night, God appears to Nathan and says, say this to my servant David. Thus says the Lord, it is not you who will build me a house to dwell in. Skip down to the end of verse 10. Moreover, I declare to you that the Lord will build you a house. David wanted to build God a house, a business, something to his glory. And God says, no, I want to build you something even better. I'm going to give you a child. Do you remember that day? Did you found out that you were going to be a dad? Did you found out you were going to be responsible for another living being? And that the doctors and nurses and social workers and caregivers weren't going home with you to help? You were going to be on your own? They were actually going to entrust this to you? You probably were anxious like I was. Three times, it doesn't get any easier, does it? To find out that you're responsible for someone else. David said, I want to build something big for God. God says, I'm going to give you a business. I'm going to give you a cure for your ills. I'm going to give you a legacy, an inheritance, something far more valuable than money. And God says, after your days are spent of living with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build the house for me, the temple And I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him as a father, and he will be to me as a son. And I will not take my steadfast love from him. We live in a generation where attachment between kids and parents is is dwindling. Kids and their siblings, as they grow older, are actually detaching. Kids are having difficulty attaching to God for very long. God says, David, I want to have such a relationship with you and your kids. We call this the unilateral, unconditional Davidic covenant. So that no matter what you do, David, no no matter what your children do after you, You will always have a son on the throne. I will always love you. Through the years of Manasseh and the years of Ammon, God continues to keep that promise. Can you imagine, parents, if we made such a deal with our kids? It doesn't matter what you do, anything too great, I can't love you any more than I already love you. It doesn't matter what you do that might be evil, I can't love you any less. I love you unilaterally, unconditionally. 
not just you, but your children after you for every generation. That could change the world. I remember my dad always saying that children don't suffer as much from a big head for being encouraged too much as they do from a broken heart. God says, I'm going to love you and your kids forever. And all David can do is say, thank you. King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I? O Lord God, what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And as though that were a small thing in your eyes, O God, you've also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. You have shown me future generations, O Lord God, and what more can David say to you for honoring your servant? What can I say? You've already done so much for me in the past, and you've shown me that my children's future is going to be so much greater than mine. If you ask a dad what they want, first thing they'll say is for their kids to have a better life than they did. Want them to experience more and suffer less. And God says, to David. That's exactly what's going to happen. All David can say is, thank you, Lord. Sometimes when we look at our lives, that's all we can say is, thank you, Lord. And so David begins to prepare for this. In chapter 22, he begins to arrange everything for his child because he doesn't want his child to suffer in the ways that he suffered. He accumulates all of this wealth. He, he organizes all of the worship that will take place in the temple that his son will in the future build. He also drives out all of the enemies, the Philistines, the Ammonites, the Moabites, so that his child won't have to suffer in the same ways, knowing that our children will suffer, but maybe not in the same ways that we do. And then, David does something that every parent should do for their child. He blesses him. Trenton Smalley, in their book, The Blessing, which I just happened upon a few years ago in our Faith and Home Center here at church. And I don't know if there's enough copies for everybody to check it out today, but you can buy your own copy if you would like. They say that every parent should bless their child in the way that Jacob blessed all 12 of his sons with specific blessings about how they are meaningful, how they are valuable, and actually to write it out and to read it regularly to your child at night or in the morning so they see the value. You can do this for your children in the faith, too, like Paul does for Timothy. And they mention five ways of doing this. First of all, they say there's this meaningful touch as you sit down with them, as you hug them, as you hold their hand at night. You show that relationship that you have with them. Then there's this spoken message, like what you've written out for them, but each night it might take a different form. As you say, I see in you a generous spirit, a kind person. And then you attach this high significance of value, saying in them that I see you as being a caregiver one day. I see in your future you being an administrator. I see you as being a, a dad or a mom like me or better than me. And then finally, there's this active commitment to remind them regularly of what you see in them and also how they're progressing in that so they can see their own growth and so that you might be reminded. Can you imagine what would happen if we did this regularly, not only would we begin to see them in their future, they begin to see us in this same way. David does something very similar for his son. In chapter 22, beginning in verse 7, David said to Solomon, My son, I had it in my heart to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. He starts out by telling his own journey his own faith story. This is what I have wanted to do for God. We can tell our children about our own faith story, about why we became Christians and why they should become Christians, why we are still Christians despite all the lows, maybe because of all the highs, what our mission has been in this life and what's still unfinished. Maybe they'll want to take part in and make a part of their mission and their journey. He says, I wanted to build this house. This was my life story. 
But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, You've shed much blood. You've waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name, because you have shed so much blood before me on the earth. He shares some of his misfortunes. Now, many of these battles he was told to fight. He was doing this on behalf of God and for his son so that he wouldn't have to experience these wars in his own lifetime. But David also shed some blood that he shouldn't have, like Uriah. One of the greatest blessings that we can give our children is to show them how to repent, how to apologize by apologizing to them when we've made a mistake, and to show them what a contrite heart looks like, how to avoid evil, and how to consistently do what is right. David says, here are some of my misfortunes, but they can be fortunes for you if you see in them wisdom. Then he says, behold, God said to me, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest. I will give him rest from all of his surrounding enemies, for his name shall be Solomon or Shalomon. You can see Shalom in his name, peace. I will give peace and quiet to Israel in his days. Wouldn't it be fun to sit down with your child and explain to them where their name comes from? Why you named them that? Maybe even why you received your name? Kind of like what Trent and Smalley talk about, the future that you see for them and that you saw that when they were just a child receiving a name. I see you as a child of peace. And so his child grows up to follow in his father's footsteps. He shall build a house for my name. He shall be my son and I will be his father and I will establish his royal throne in Israel forever. David also shows Solomon his connection to God. God is your father as well, showing our children that God values them, that he loves them, that no matter what they do, God will always be there for them. Then David says a prayer, a prayer for his son to seek the Lord, a prayer for his son to seek discretion and understanding, verse 12. He prayed that his son might pray. We we pray for our children, but do we pray that our children will pray, and do we give them specific things to pray for? He says, I want you to pray for discretion and understanding. And his son certainly heard that, and it made a tremendous impact on his life. And then, according to chapter 28, God hands David the blueprints for building the temple, just like Moses received the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God, and then David hands the blueprints to his son. This is what God has for you. If we see a vision of what our children can be, and we bless them, and we tell them our story, and we show them how they can find their own story therein, and we give them the blueprints of what God has for their life, and specifically what we see them fulfilling in their life, Something amazing happens. We just turn the pages a, a few, and we find in, first, in Second Chronicles chapter 1 that one of the first things Solomon does when he becomes king is he offers sacrifices at Gilboa, this site in Gibeon where Moses and Aaron set up the Ark of the Covenant. Just like his dad's first pursuit was to make a house for God, at least in his heart. That's what he wanted to do. So his son's first action is to worship God. And it started with their ancestors, as it often does with a grandmother or a grandfather. Then God appears to him, not just once, but twice. He actually has a deeper relationship with God than his dad, which is what every father wants for their child. And God says, ask what I shall give to you. And he says, I want wisdom and understanding, just like what his father told him to pray for. And then he takes all of the resources, all of the preparation, the blueprints that his father handed to him, and he builds a house for God, a house that all nations will enter into. It all started with a dad who wanted to build a house for God, and ends with God building a house for David, for Solomon, for all future 
generations. But it actually started much earlier than that with Naomi and Ruth and Boaz back in our Mother's Day lesson, the ancestors of David and Solomon, because mothers and fathers and grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and friends are all necessary to raise up a child in the Lord. It takes a village. And then in the future, a 12-year-old boy comes to the rebuilt temple of Solomon. And while he's talking with the leaders who are there, his parents come to him and say, why have you done this to us? And he says, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? Some translations have in my father's house. He wasn't talking about David and Solomon alone. He was talking about God because Mary and Joseph had helped their son come to realize who his true father really is. As parents, we want our children to experience more than we've experienced. We want them to avoid many of our pitfalls, but ultimately what we want for them is to be about their father's business so that one day they'll be in their father's house. One way we can do that is by capturing that vision in our mind of what God has in store for them and then sharing that vision with them so they can begin to see it and make it their own. We are so grateful for earthly fathers who have done so much for us to bring us to where we are today. But we're even more grateful for our Heavenly Father who will take us the rest of the way. And so your children will follow you wherever you go. They want to be just like you. Will you come? Father God, just for today, I would also like to express Happy Father's Day to all of our dads who have worshiped with us today. We are so grateful for the presence of everyone here today. Whether you're worshiping here in the building or online, we are so grateful to you. And if you are visiting today and are looking for a church home, we hope that you will consider the college church and connect with us online. What a marvelous job that everyone who led in our worship today has done. How about that new father-in-law? 
who led our singing this morning. What an outstanding job that he did. And Jordan, what a great lesson. I have a poem today just for you. Are you surprised about that? You're not. Well, here it goes. Each Sunday morning, we come to the college church to worship the Lord Most High. We're spiritually fed each week with outstanding lessons from the extremely talented and gifted Jordan Guy. Thank you, Jordan, so much. We love you and appreciate you. We love Todd, and we appreciate all of those who have led in worship this morning. We do have these announcements for our church family. First of all, Bob Allen remains hospitalized in Newport Beach, California, and he hopes to get some answers from some tests later this week, and he specifically asks for our prayers. And then to the family of Marcy Lloyd, to uh, Ted Lloyd and his family who lost Marcy this week on Wednesday. There will be a visitation tomorrow at 1 o'clock here in the, at the College Church in the family room, followed by a memorial service at 2 o'clock. Marcy was in Larry Long Shepherding Group, and Nick has asked me to announce that his house will be closed tomorrow so that those involved with that can attend that service. By the decorations in the building, you see that we are now ready for Vacation Bible School. It starts tonight at 6 o'clock here at the College Church in collaboration with Downtown, Cloverdale, and Westside, and it will run through Wednesday evening. Please visit our website or follow the link on the slide to register your children ages 3 through entering the sixth grade. Also want to point out that there will be an adult Bible class provided each evening with babysitting available. We also need volunteers. If you are a seventh grader or older, we'd love to have your help. Register at the same site to be a tribe leader, help in a class, help in the kitchen, or in the nursery. We also are in need of apples, bananas, grapes, and oranges for our VBS. You can drop those off now through Wednesday in the kitchen on the counter clearly marked VBS fruit donations. And I must add that any white chocolate macadamia nut cookies are asked to be given directly to Noel Whitlock, and he will see that they are properly disposed of. <laughs> and then to the Faith Builders Bible class, Room 100 is set up for VBS, therefore it will not be available for Bible class this morning. If you usually attend the Faith Builders Bible class, you are invited to join the auditorium class led by the great theologian and great Bible teacher Tom Alexander. I know that you'll enjoy that. Well, those are our announcements this morning. Thank you again for being here. We thank those who've led in our service. Please stay for one of our great Bible classes. And now, one of our shepherds, Brian Burks, will lead us in a closing prayer. I'm looking out over a congregation of many wonderful fathers. Uh, I see a lot of smiles out there, a lot of uh, different ages of fathers. I was blessed with a wonderful father. He's probably watching online at this time. And we all have our own memories of growing up, and I think of sports a lot. Many of us have that connection with our fathers. I think of, I specifically remember baseball, and he was a coach. Uh, we didn't win many games, but we had a good time. Uh, we always got the sportsmanship trophy. I think that's probably the best lesson to have. Uh, that's Because my baseball career didn't last beyond like 11 years old, so I think I'm better off this way. But we all have... Fathers who have blessed us and shown us how to love and take care of their spouses and just love on us. Let's close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together at this time. We're thankful for this worship that we've had to worship and to praise your name and to lift your voice up, and that is our goal to do, to rededicate our lives to you. 
to rededicate all that we have to you to bring you glory. And at the same time, Father, that has been an encouragement to us. That has given us strength for the coming week. That has helped us to rededicate our lives to you. And we're thankful for this time that we've had. Father, as a shepherd representing the other shepherds, we pray over this church family. We pray for so many needs that are here that are known to you. We know of some of them, maybe many of them, but not all of them. And we pray for your wisdom. We pray for your love. Father, we pray for the physical needs, and we've, we know so many who are sick and who are hurting, for emotional needs, for even financial needs, and most importantly, the spiritual needs, for people to grow in their faith, to grow closer to you, to know you better, to spend more time in your word, to pray more to you, Father, and help us to reach out and encourage those. We're mindful of the Lloyd family at this time, for Marcy Lloyd and her wonderful Christian example for us over these many, many years. And we're sad for losing her and pray that you'll be with the family, be with Ted and with the kids and all those who know her so well. She will be missed, but we are so thankful that she is with you at this time. And, and we look forward to having a celebration tomorrow. Father, we're thankful for Father's Day, as has already been mentioned and brought up to you in prayer and and we've been reminded of help us as fathers to be a blessing to our families to share our faith to point to you and to give you all the glory and father help us to do this moving forward and provide this for our families and all that we do be with us now as we go to our classes and uh, thank you for our teachers and for all those who work so hard to lead us in our class time together it's in your son's name we pray Amen.